Hey everyone, this is Michael Cole, VP of Marketing at Everflow. Today I'm excited to be joined by Jonah Donna from Outbrain. We're going to be chatting about the secrets from the top direct response marketers and affiliates using Outbrain for their native advertising. To get us started, we'll do some quick fire questions. So first off, Joe, how, what is your role at Outbrain? Right now, uh, team lead of performance marketing partnerships. So that includes affiliates, offer owners, anybody that's using us as a lower funnel acquisition tool for the most part. Cool. What does it actually look like? We have a team of about 10 people, um, including sales and account management, just working specifically with this vertical. And in the past, uh, I've been with, with Outbrain for about six years and sellers and account managers would work on performance marketers and affiliates in the morning sometimes, and then work with somebody like Netflix and Activision in the afternoon. And while that was good and fun and we learned a lot, we were realizing we were selling both of those opportunities short because we weren't as focused on each of their needs, right? So we kind of morphed into creating this team just dedicated to this subset of marketers. And it's really paid off so far. And is a goal there to just like get them to improve the results so they can ramp up? What is it? Like, what is the sort of the goal of the team that's like a success? Yeah, just, I mean, native is, is like a third um, a third tool in a lot of marketers toolkit, right? They do Facebook and social and search and display and all that good stuff. Um, and we just really help transition them from using some of those assets onto native and mm -hmm. testing efficiently, not blowing their budget um, with no conversions coming in and not making any money and just trying to help them ramp up and make native and evergreen profitable channel for them is, is really the ultimate goal there. Awesome. And I mean, you spoke a bit about what Outbrain does, but how big is Outbrain? We are a little bit over a thousand people now, thanks to some recent acquisitions, um, publicly traded as of July last year. And yeah, we're, we're continually growing. I think like everybody right now, it's the hiring craze is, is really on. So I guess we're trying to continue getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> I always think of you as one of the biggest for as a native advertising platform. What is the official like brand positioning statement? <laughs> I think the official brand positioning statement is, uh, and although it might not be like completely true, the founders of native advertising as, as like the modern definition of it. I think there were a few ad tech companies before Outbrain, but in terms of securing the, the more premium publisher partnerships, like the CNNs, like the Washington Post of the world, that's where we like to um, place ourselves based on, you know, quality journalism and all the top big publishers. And even since like 16 years ago, that's where we retain the space that we play in. Um, that's it's usually the inventory that, that our advertisers see. I mean, you're definitely doing some stuff right. You've hit a thousand people. <laughs> I think you've, you've proven that you're pretty a dominant player in that space. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a couple others in here as well. But for the most part, I mean, if, if someone's interested in native, we all have exclusive inventory sources. Um, mm -hmm. So the majority of marketers aren't just working with just Outbrain. They're working with a handful of competitors and it's all well and good. You know, there's a huge, huge digital world of, of ads out there and inventory. So it's usually what happens. Awesome. And how did you get involved in the, indus in the industry in the first place? Well, I went to college for lacrosse and that sounds like a joke, but I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I picked marketing and like any uh, kind of like college athlete that doesn't really know what to do in the professional world. I just was applying to a ton of different marketing jobs, eventually landed myself in a, in a sales job working for an independent publisher. And what my job was, was to create these like advocacy, advocacy campaigns um, in print and digital formats. And then in order to fund them, we would sell ads uh, against them for, for both print and digital. But in order to hit our digital readership guarantee, like if I sold an ad to Microsoft and I would say, hey, you know, 25,000 people are going to see this ad, my company would actually buy traffic through Outbrain to arbitrage it. And when Outbrain came in and presented kind of what they were doing for us and how it all worked, I was sitting there just on the couch, just wondering why I wouldn't work for a company like that. It seemed really cool. It was more tech, we couldn't do it ourselves and this company was doing it for us. So what gives? And six years ago, I joined Outbrain. It was kind of like a one-off application saying, hey, you know, I think this is really cool. We're already working with you guys and been there ever since. So very fortunate um, in terms of like where 
I landed and just digital advertising in general, kind of how it's grown and everything. Um, so it's a little bit of luck, a little bit of hard work kind of combination. <laughs> That's awesome. And I want to stop and uh, go back on those things that you mentioned, because um, in my past, I worked for a branded content startup where we were selling like a, a full branded content package across a lot of like blogs and pages and everything. And native advertising was like a clear channel that worked really well. But I think that it's the one of the things that no one realizes is that if you work with these prestigious brands, they'll sell you on like, hey, we'll generate this many impressions. But like a significant amount of the impressions that they're generating is actually them doing media buying to their direct major publication. And these are the biggest in the world. So yeah. <laughs> I think that's a, a reality that people have no idea exists. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, uh, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get into it, but it's why I really like working with this particular marketer set rather than mm -hmm. working with the larger brands and agencies, because as good as they are, and as creative as they are, sometimes there is this lack of, I guess, like knowledge of what's under the hood of, of how all, all things work. And usually affiliates and performance marketers and people in this space are so dialed in with, with how things tick and how to make them perform better that it just, uh, I don't know. It's more suited for my interests. It's it's more fun to work in, quite honestly. Yeah, and the other thing I remember is uh, just we tested a lot of different like channels to like drive performance on top of the branded content, and native advertising was pretty much the only one that drove full results out of all the DSPs we tested, and that ended up being like the main like performance side of the offering. So, it's a a cool. good proof. Um, for the viability of the space and especially a uh, questionable thing about a lot of the other advertising out there. <laughs> yeah, right. Cool. So what is one goal you want to achieve this year? Oh man. Um, <laughs> I think like as any, uh, you know, leader in this world, I think it comes down to how many advertisers we can make successful on the platform. And I know I'm not trying to get like too, um, you know, like technical and uh, manager wording, but churn rate is a big thing that we focus on. And churn rate to us means the amount of advertisers that come in and test and the amount of advertisers that either stay with us or no longer work with Outbrain. And the reason that we form this team dedicated to just performance marketers and affiliates is to decrease that churn rate substantially. So my goal, you know, from, from last year into this year is to cut that in half, if not even more. And really provide an opportunity for these advertisers to test successfully and come out of testing feeling like they've accomplished something instead of coming out of testing and feeling like, man, that, that was a waste of my money. I don't think I'm going to come back to native. And now I have this bad taste in my mouth because there are a lot of different, like you said, ad networks and stories and how people are successful and aren't successful, but really cutting that, that churn rate and having our customers stay for a longer period of time is, is the ultimate goal for me. I think it's one of the nicest things that's so healthy about how the entire industry and all the B2B SaaS world is is gone is that now churn is pretty much, if not the most important thing, like getting churned down, it, it's definitely among the top five most important things for most like modern companies. And like, that's just a, a much healthier ecosystem than these companies that were just like grow and don't worry about what you burn down on the way to like just massive growth. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like we'd rather invest more in, on the front end, you know, training somebody on the platform, spending that extra as minimal as it is hour a week, you know, with that advertiser to, to allow them to understand what we would do in certain situations. I mean, it all, it all helps. The investment helps um, when it's all said and done after that testing period. For sure. Especially an industry like yours. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing on native advertising, like there's a lot of decisions to make. And there's a lot of different levels of cost between different placements. So not having any, like, I mean, the reason we were able to make it successful is that we had a couple of people coming from the native advertising space that already knew placements that drove results. And then once you see results, you can scale it, but you really do need that like guidance of like where to start that will show you the immediate, like the fastest results for dollars spent. Totally. It's a, uh... It's a, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Like mm -hmm. people that come into native, the ecosystem is so big and there's so much room to be successful. But if you don't come in the right way, you can really get smoked, um, to put it, to put it bluntly. And, uh, 
that's what our team is here to kind of try and alleviate, you know, mm-hmm. less pressure, more success set up correctly from the beginning. And yeah, I, that's, that's the goal. That's awesome. So we'll hop into like some longer form discussion topics. So the first one, you mentioned to us that affiliate marketers are some of the biggest users of Outbrain. What do they know about the channel that many brands don't? I think it kind of goes back to what I, what I just said is that the, the inventory stack is huge. Like there's so many, and, and kind of to what you said, that there's so many publishers, there's so many different units that you can appear on those publishers or different types of targeting. And the whole double-edged sword is that there, there are so many variables that, that you have to worry about, but also all those variables, tweaking them even 10, 20% can make your campaign profitable or, or unprofitable, right? And I think the most successful affiliate marketers and performance marketers now are leaning into that control mm-hmm. and you know, trusting the algorithm a little bit, but really like diving deeper into all of that data and making these adjustments and saying, you know what, if I make these adjustments, things are gonna perform better. I think a lot of times people coming from Facebook media buying their algorithm in the past was, was so strong that you could spend a hundred dollars, $200 a day. And you're, you know, 20% profitable out of the gates. And unfortunately native just doesn't work like that. So when there is time from that affiliate perspective and, and media buying perspective to, to dive deeper, that's what these guys are doing differently than, than some of the other larger brands or unsuccessful people um, leveraging native because the tools the toolkit is immense especially from when i started six years ago i mean it is just completely flipped on its head more geared for performance marketers and they're just using more of those tools more um, than i think a lot of people want to or maybe people aren't aren't really familiar with it so let's talk about that a little bit so we have a lot of uh facebook media buyer affiliates promoting our customers if they were switching now that we all know that like Facebook has been a complete mess and SCAD network in terms of like its effectiveness dropping and the cost going up. And so if they want to test out native advertising for the first time, like what would be like the, the first few things that you would recommend? Like here are the first things to do on Outbrain to make this successful. It kind of comes down to a couple of things. Like, first of all, the ad copy is going to be different. Um, on Outbrain and other native channels, if you're familiar with the inventory, you're on a publisher, you see the image, there's a little bit of a headline. There's no description, like how Facebook has some of that description language in there. You really have like 60 to 75 characters to really capture the person that you want to, um, in addition to that image and, and get them to click, right? So just transitioning and saying, I'm just gonna rip everything I have on Facebook and use the same images and put it on Outbrain doesn't really work that way, especially because text and images, which a lot of people use and use in their video creative on Facebook, doesn't really work that well on Outbrain. Um, And video specifically really isn't a performance tool yet on Outbrain, especially for DR marketers. Um, It's just just not. So trying to find your your best static images, trimming down your headline copy uh, to 60 to 75 characters, that's the main thing from the front end. And then on the, the secondary piece of that, a lot of people do really, really well with like e-com style. I clicked on this Facebook ad. Now I'm going to this page. I'm going to buy this product with minimal, um, minimal text, minimal description, minimal like sell to it, you know? And Outbrain just isn't that type of platform where somebody is, is ready to buy right away. It's a platform where someone's reading an article, they click on it, they're going to try and learn something about something they're interested in. Maybe they never thought they'd be interested in, but there's an education piece there that needs to happen before the actual ask for sale happens. So the biggest thing that we've been coaching people on now is how to make that bridge page, interstitial page, jump page, whatever you want to call it is how important that is to success on, on the platform to give people some form of education before the sell, before the video, before they ask to buy mm-hmm. and really just coming up with a, a best practice there. I think those are like the main things um, that have to be different maybe most times from what I see. So on that, so having like say an advertorial landing page, so click on the native, you see the native ad with a good headline, you click on it, you see like a sort of like semi-review landing page. For most of your, 
um, affiliate marketer clients, are they the ones building out all those landing pages? Are they sending it to one um, with the brand merchant? Are they working like, what is, what is usually the, the relationship of like that next page? They're usually building it out or they're using something like an Insta page um, mm -hmm. or, you know, have, have friends in the industry, they can create a landing page for them, but we don't help create it. We can give best practices with how much text and what type of images to use all that jazz. But um, yeah, usually they're, they're creating it. Awesome. And I mean, that's a totally different skill set for someone who's just used to the Facebook media buying and everything. So how do you like, I'm sure yeah. they have this all the problem all the time with just really successful affiliates and no media buying in and out that have never really worked on the landing page side. How do you typically coach them on what kind of content they should be doing? Like, what should they be considering there? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people with a ton of marketing experience that this is just a, a new skill for them to learn based that is a natural progression from what they've already been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Copywriting is a huge skill. Copywriting and media buying. Usually when we talk to offer owners and people that actually own the product, right? I can't tell you how many people I've talked to where it's like one person's the copywriter, the other person's the media buyer. Mm -hmm. They form this company, they create the product together because it's equal parts. It's like, you know, if your copy is not good, your media buying is not going to work. And if your media buying is not good, it doesn't matter how good your copy is, it's not going to work. So there's a, I mean, right now it's just a big network of referrals for people that we know in the industry that are really good copywriters or really good media buyers. And from being in the world for the last couple of years, being able to put people in touch with the right people is something that um, is important to me and that I, that I do a lot and our team does a lot. Um, another quick shout out, uh, like Stefan Georgie and Justin Goff's Copy Accelerator group, friendly with those guys. Um, they are not the only ones, but they do the most like education of how you can increase your copy um, and get it to convert better and make it so that it's good for direct response marketing. And I think another misconception, not for like the power media buyers and power advertisers, but people that are newer to the affiliate game is like, oh, I'm just going to grab this link from ClickBank and I'm just going to like, you know, run with it and throw it up. And there's so much more work that needs to be done. It's literally like a business, you know, you need to be thinking about it like a business and you need to invest in it like that. So in addition to all that stuff, showing minimal examples of what's working and what's not working. You know, if somebody comes to me and they say, Hey, um, I want to run this drone product in Australia, you know, how should my landing page look? We, we sit on a ton of data, right? And I can see what landing pages are converting and what landing pages aren't. So being able to show anybody that's coming into the network what's actually working and what's not is, is important to giving them examples. And obviously no one's directly copying the exact thing, but showing them the flow and some of the language in there is, is something that we do too. Oh, wow. That must be fascinating to have access to that data. <laughs> it is. It's definitely, uh, it's cool to say. Yeah, we, we sit on a lot of it. It's just hard to share sometimes, you know, it's hard to ingest it and then figure out what's real and what's not. And it could be, it's, it's hard because it's, like I just said, like it could be the media buyer doing something really good. It could be the copy doing something really good. It could be the product has a different mm -hmm. break even point. Like there's so many different variables, but we try and at least share what we can and, um, you know, let, let people get after it how they want. We can revisit this at the end, but. I'd love to just ask you if someone wanted to test out Outbrain that had a lot of media buying experience, uh, what would be the best way to sort of like go into that whole being referred to someone who might be able to help them with like the landing page and copy part? I would just reach out to me um, and, and our team and we can point you in the right direction. And I think, uh, I assume you'll probably put some, some contact info in there. I mean, when this gets posted on LinkedIn and everywhere, you can hit me up there, but I'm also on Skype. You just search my name, <laughs> Joseph Adana. Um, email is J-A-D-D-O-N-A -D -D -A at outbrain.com. So anything anybody needs, um, even if we're not going to work together and you want to buy traffic on Facebook and you need a copywriter, happy to uh, happy to make the, the referral for, for anyone that's interested. I'm sure you get a lot of uh, Skype waves from random yeah people. yeah too many <laughs> too many these days i've had that happen from people i actually know and i'm like what are you even doing <laughs> yeah you're just asking i'm getting blocked 
we're getting influxes from like all over the world too. It's like, and it, it's fine. You know, I put people in the right direction, but it's crazy once you have like your name and, and Outbrain is in my Skype name. So when people have questions about Outbrain, whether they're in Romania, California, or Brazil, if they're, you know, you're going to, you're going to get that message, which is cool. It's cool to see how many people are interested, but um, yeah, Skype's a, Skype's a different <laughs> beast. <laughs> so let's go a little bit back. So what should everyone know before testing out native advertising? And I think on, since we talked about like now, like you need to know some of the media buying side, you need to build a landing page that is effective, but like on terms of like the offers and everything else, like what when should they start like if you're a brand say when should you start considering testing out native advertising like what needs to be in place before you even consider it for the best experience you need to follow the seasonality trends and what i mean by that is q1 and the q2 is really focused on a lot of health products right health supplements um cpcs so the costs to enter the network are, are lower than they are in any time over the year in q1 so these these you know, higher ticket health items have a bigger margin and people are more interested and invested in their health within the first half of the year. So if you're a health product, thinking about it then, um, if you're more in like the e-com and gadget listicle type space, you really don't want to be testing out brain until October. Um, it's really, really hard to find success over the summer and in the beginning of the year with that, when people aren't really focused on gifting or buying things. Um, it just, for what we've seen, doesn't really work that well. And then one of the bigger avenues that's really exploded that we might talk about later is uh, lead generation. So solar, health insurance, life insurance, Medicare, auto insurance, home refinancing, all that stuff is pretty much able to be tested at any given time of the year. Um, but if you're a brand and you focus on those either of those two ends of the spectrum, you should really follow those seasonality trends. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be really hard to find success, at least initially. And then once you get data built up, then you're able to run throughout the year and you kind of, you know, can, can navigate the, the turmoil a little bit more. But um, it's really important to jump in when seasonally appropriate for, for your brand. That's incredible advice. And I'm sure that saves so many affiliate marketers a lot of like tears and sadness when they try to test out everything at once before they have any idea what works. And then they're just like, well, I guess we'll never make e-commerce successful in January. When yeah. really, if they had tested it at the end of the year, they would have known like, okay, these placements are great. Let's keep testing them out afterwards, but then we'll ramp up other stuff during the best season for that. Yeah, totally. And like, you know, being a, like for, from our end, being that, that consultant more so than just like the sales guy trying to get you up, trying to get you live, get you testing. Hey, it's going to work. We just need more data. That's not really how we want to operate. It's not good for us. It's not good for them. It's not good for the golden churn rate. It's just, you know, not a good way to do business. So um, we always will say and be as honest as possible saying like, yeah, you, you know, now's a good time or, Hey, you know, maybe you should hold off on this for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Like you're a lot, you're very, incentivized in a lot like you're in lined in your incentives compared to something that is okay with brand awareness like if you're expecting performance which of course any affiliate marketer is like they have to see performance so they're not going to use more outbrain so it yeah is, totally it's always nice when you're fully aligned with the person spending money yeah 100 <laughs> percent. cool so what would you say are some of the stuff that you're seeing like the best affiliate marketers succeeding on outbrain that they're doing better than everyone else? I think it kind of goes back to the point of they, they like the algorithm and they trust it a little bit, but they know that in order to get the most success out of the platform, they're spending time a half hour, maybe 45 minutes a day looking at publisher sections and ads that they're that they're running on and the ads that they're running and manually increasing and decreasing the bid based on how how successful that publisher section is so to give you an example right if if an affiliate is running across the operating network and they see traffic from cnn as a publisher mm -hmm. well cnn has 
CNN homepage, CNN money, CNN tech, CNN travel. There's a lot of different sections within these different publisher groupings that we have, and they all perform differently for whatever reason, you know, based on what articles are on there, based on um, the amount of inventory we have on, on all of those sections. And the most successful affiliate media buyers are, are, are digging into that and bidding up on things that are working well and bidding down on things that aren't working well. And I can't tell you how many of the, of the top performing affiliate marketers, the top scaling ones, their top 250 spending sections for the most part all have bid adjustments on those sections. Mm -hmm. And that's so important to be able to craft your, you know, the list that works for you and your particular offer, because it's never going to be the same. If, if, if you come to me with a um, life insurance offer and, and somebody else comes to me with one, it, it, they're never going to perform apples to apples. It's very, it's very, very rare. So they, the best media buyers are taking advantage of all the data they see and being able to dig in and manipulate it. And I think the um, the misconception is, oh, well, I'm only going to bid up on the ones that work or, oh, I'm only going to bid down on the ones that don't work and the algorithm's going to going to figure it out for me and, and I'll just be hands off. Unfortunately, we're just not the platform for that. You know, you, you really need to invest the time in, in, in not only blocking things, but in a bid on CNN travel at 45 cents might be profitable for you but a bid on CNN homepage, the bid might have to be 65 cents. So you need to look at the data and, and the best media buyers are doing this and, and bid up and down based on what that profitability number is. And it takes a little bit of work and that's what we do to help train people on. But um, yeah, most of those big media buyers, their top 250 sections are dialed in with manual bid adjustments. And it's not just set it and forget it. Let's let the algorithm figure it out. And that's what they're doing differently. Awesome. Um, and it's kind of a side thing I was just thinking, but especially when testing out new offers or new verticals and stuff, would you recommend that the buyer start with big publications or long tail publications? Definitely so more tier one publishers. Washington Post, long tail being like individual, like small blogs and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the network is kind of separated into three different sections. What we see now, one is being like tier one, big heavy hitters, like the CNN and Washington Post of the world, right? The next is more localized news publications, um, like Gray TV and, you know, local news and things like that. And then the other one is our, our platform business, which is things like T-Mobile, Cricket, Samsung, all these uh, mobile first platforms. And what we do to set up somebody first, we usually put them on the top tier one traffic, right? Like the most quality, the most premium, that's where the premium audiences live. We're gonna dive into that first. And that's something that we help with. Unfortunately, if you go in and try and launch an outbreak campaign yourself without a rep, you're gonna be across 10,000 publishers and it's next to impossible to find success to, to put it frankly. Um, and we usually recommend starting on the, the most premium quality inventory stack there. But depending on the offer, we have different recommendations. Like a lot of the lead gen for, for solar and life insurance, they actually do really, really well on that platform inventory. So that T-Mobile and Cricket inventory does super well for them. But for somebody that's you know doing a probiotic and a health supplement, T-Mobile and Cricket don't perform well at all because it's a higher ticket item. It's not so much of a, hey, I'm gonna submit my information. and you know It's just a lead. So it depends um, and we kind of, make those recommendations and, and try and put them on the best path, depending on who it is and, and what the goal is, you know? And it's like the T-Mobile and cricket stuff. Is that, is that like a, what, what does that inventory kind of like look like? Is it a bunch, is it just basically stuff they manage? What, what is it actually, is it like showing offers to their customers? Yeah. It's like, you know how um, it's like, you know how Apple News has the Apple News uh, app and you can you know, read a bunch of articles? It's the same kind of thing. T-Mobile oh. and Cricket have their own like news platform within their browser and on their phone specifically. And they also can push news if people opt in to, um, to the phones directly. So that's kind of how it, how it looks and operates there. That's awesome. I mean, that's still really great inventory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit, but if you don't mind sort of like, just laying it out, like what, 
are like the main categories like let's do it the opposite way what are the verticals of offers that you think should never be tested or like are very unlikely to succeed like when when is native native advertising not a good choice yeah that's a good question um i think a lot of the free plus shipping offers never really work um and uh, i mean the price point's just too low to be successful usually um free plus shipping things like books and um you know, like self-help e-courses, relationship advice type things. For whatever reason, those uh, like the, those digital products never really, I haven't really ever seen them take off. I'm, maybe they will. I, I hope I hope they do for a more <laughs> di diversified uh, network um, in the future. But I, I think that the cost of acquisition that needs to be had is just so low for some of those that it's it's hard to it's hard to make work on the platform. And, and kind of to your point about like, you know, what works and and what doesn't work if there's a you know a health supplement offer and your allowable cpa is less than let's call it 60 bucks it's going to be really hard to to find success on the operating platform um same thing with like a gadget offer if you're trying to sell a like a smart e-bulb and it's smoking for you on facebook at a 20 dollar cpa it's next to impossible to find a $20 CPA for, for some of those e-com and gadget products on Outbrand. Usually it has to be around like the 40, $45 mark. And those are the things that we help answer a lot of times. And when affiliates say like, hey, I have these five offers here in my payouts, what should I run? That's like the best, you know, partnership that I that that we can ask for because we're understanding what you have access to, we're understanding what would work and what wouldn't work. And a lot of times it's just that the things that are, are working on other channels are, may just not be good for native. And it's trying to fit like a, um, a square peg into a round hole type situation. Mm -hmm. So from a uh, personal curiosity, do you see success with uh, B2B and SaaS products? A bigger B2B and SaaS products. Yeah. Like uh, Salesforce and HP. Right, like those really guys. Like LTVs where they can afford to yeah. buy a lot of inventory per customer. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, I, you know, like one of the, just side note, like one of the funniest things I've ever worked on is uh, a company called Sealed Air. This was like five years ago. And uh, if, <laughs> I don't even want to say if, when you get your Amazon package, you know, those little like, uh, yeah little puffs of air that are within mm -hmm. your amazon package they they were running on outbrain to put it in front of uh you know like small business owners so that way they could acquire new customers for, for shipping and you'd never even think about it but when when you know that outbrain is on time inc and cnn and fortune and these big publications like a lot of these you know, executives and, and people that are in these, these worlds, you know, read, read those publications. So yeah, it definitely works well in, in small doses. B2B isn't the biggest vertical on Outbrain, but it's, uh, it's successful when we, when we do it right, because we have the targeting to do it. So, yeah. Is that using the same business model or the same promotion model where it's basically avatorial of like something a little bit interesting about say Salesforce that then links to an avatorial about like why, Salesforce like amplifies your growth a million times more than not using it. Is that is that still the same format? Yeah, for the most part. Um, for the most part, that that's how it works. I would say a lot of these these uh, bigger companies aren't as nimble and can't really create a super specified page for native. So a lot mm -hmm. of times it's like their search lander or um, you know maybe even promoting their homepage or or like a, a blog post in, in some cases, but. The idea is still the same um, throughout the whole thing. Awesome. Yeah. And let's see, uh, what are the biggest mistakes that you see um, with native advertising campaigns? Hmm. I would say the, the biggest mistake is just it's, it's a, it's a different channel, you know, and expecting it to perform the same way as another channel. I know that sounds so simple, but 
you know, a lot of times people, people come in and it, it really takes a commitment if, if you've never bought on native, or even if you have, and you've had a bad taste in the mouth, your mouth, because it hasn't performed well in the past, it's going to take a little bit of money to find your sites and to find your ads that are working well. Um, and if you don't have, you know, three to $5,000 in most cases at a minimum to test, then it's, it's probably not worth your time, um, to, to, to run, unfortunately. Um, yeah. and to, to try and, to try and ramp up. And I think the biggest mistake is, is people come in and they, they, and I, and I put myself in their shoes all the time. Like if it's my personal credit card and I'm running 600 bucks of traffic and it's not looking how I want it to, then I'm probably going to be skittish too, for sure. So it's hard to sometimes to like give this recommendation, but it's, 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 it's the right recommendation. You kind of just have to, you know, take on that risk a little bit and allow things to run and allow it to get the data back or else it's, it's just, it's just not worth it. So people turn, when people turn things off in, in a couple of days, because it's negative 50%, like if we're negative 50% on, on our return on ad spend in, in three days, that's a freaking win in my book. Like we're, we'll get you there. We're getting conversions. We'll, we're going to make optimizations. We're going to, we're going to get there after a week and a half. So it's, uh, but I get that it's hard and it's a risk and it's money and you know, it, uh, it is what it is, but that's just the type of platform we are, unfortunately, um, right now. I mean, anything that's too easy, then it's going to just get competitive and more expensive until it's no longer easy. So yeah. it's the nature of all advertising. Yeah, for sure. And I think like kind of made me think of another point too, is people will come in and they know that, you know, their CPC needs to be 20 cents because their landing page conversion rate is X amount. And it needs to be 20 cents because they need to bring this many people here to make it profitable. But on Outbrain and on any advertising platform, really, whether it's our competitors or whoever, you need a aggressive bid from the beginning to get your ad score up because the way that you win the high quality inventory on Outbrain, it's a combination of your click-through rate and the CPC that you're willing to bid. And the only control variable that any advertiser has, has when they launch a campaign is that CPC. We don't know how your ads are going to get clicked on. We don't know. We can give you an estimate, maybe what that will be, but you need to start aggressive and then you bring it down over time. So the aggressive bid in the beginning is, is there for a reason. It's not always going to be that aggressive. It's there to get you through the exploration phase in the network and have you get a good ad score retained on that campaign. So that way you continually win that inventory. So that's another thing too. People try and drop it super fast because it's not working. And they're like, oh, well, I'm just going to pay less, you know, and then I'm going to make more. But that's not really how it works. When you start getting defaulted to lower tier inventory and you're on later in the day and it just, it's a snowball effect, which isn't good. Yeah, and I, I think clear from talking with you, the other common mistake is not, just leveraging a rep from day one because it sounds like and I mean that was our experience too like having a great rep who can send you in the right direction like that's how you see results right away yeah yeah it's really it's really important um especially from the beginning cool so the next thing I'd like to talk about is around creatives so how much creative should they have at the beginning so let's say for a single product they're promoting how many create like headlines should they have creative should they have and how often do they need to refresh this? Yeah, it's a good question. So the ideal starting point for headlines and images is a combination of probably six to eight total pieces of creative, whether that's four headlines and two images, two headlines and four images. Um, that's usually what we recommend regardless of the budget level. The reason for that is kind of what we talked about earlier. There's so many variables to an outbrain campaign what publisher section you're going to be on what you know where you are in that in that widget feed um, on that publisher section um, what time of day what device like there's so many things that we have to look at to make the campaign perform the more ads you put in there and if you try and load in you know 15 30 ads for the system that ab tests there's not enough spend behind each of those for the system to kind of figure out what, what's working. And that's why we recommend starting with kind of a, a lower volume. Usually after uh, probably less than a week, five to seven days, 
we trim out 80% of those ads and usually only keep one to two pieces of creative live within each campaign. Um, because those are the winning ones. Those are the ones that we know are working and the system's already gravitating towards those because it has a low acquisition cost. So we're going to pause everything else out, try and stick with those. And then we would start fresh again in a new campaign, maybe test some of that creative that we thought, Hey, that's weird. That didn't work. I'm going to try it again, but now remove some of those performers that are already live in the other one. Um, and just continue that, that process a little bit. I would say a full creative refresh really isn't necessary too often, maybe every like three to four weeks um, is, is when we, we usually see that. A lot of times the biggest advertisers on Outbrain 2 are duplicating campaigns using the same creative and trying to take advantage of a different time of day, you know, a different, um, just different time in market, you know, different news cycle, like launching something on a Monday can perform vastly different than launching something on a Friday in some cases, depending on what's going on in the news. Prime example, you know, today we're talking February 24th and the whole Russia, Ukraine thing mm -hmm. is going on. Um, and I guarantee you page views on CNN are skyrocketing and there's a ton of inventory there. But does that mean that people are going to be clicking on your ad and converting and wanting to buy a you know, a probiotic? No, they're probably there because they're, they're reading about the news. And if somebody, if advertisers are launching say on February 24th, I would bet that that performance isn't going to be good, even though they're getting clicks at a cheaper rate. So running that, duplicating the same exact creative next week could have vastly different performance implications in the long run. And that's kind of something that not a lot of people think about and uh, take advantage of. No, oh, that's super fascinating and definitely a unique thing to native advertising that people don't really consider. Cool. So um, similar to that, uh, do you have any sort of like insights you've been seeing regarding like landing pages? So for affiliate marketers that you know are having a ton of success, are they basically finding a lander that works, maybe doing like very mild split testing and they just that is the lender for that campaign and they move on to the next thing or are they constantly updating the landing pages too? Yeah, it's usually uh, just some split testing in the beginning and then working with working with one. Um, usually when the lander and the copywriting is done well, that's, you know, we, we know that for a fact and then it's just about finding the sites. Um, sometimes in the beginning, we'll rotate two to three landing pages to see what's working well. But again, it's kind of, a lot of people don't really do that on Outbrain unless they're spending a lot of money because there's so many variables to it. Like it might not be the landing page. It might be the, you know, it might be the day, it might be the article that they're on. It might be the publisher. So trying to, you know, split test landers when you're testing $350 a day and there's so many other things going on, it's really not worth it to do. But some of the bigger advertisers that are running, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 a day, they have the ability to get that mass amount of clicks and actually see what's working and what's not. So usually it's only, it's only one lander. Awesome. And are you seeing any tools that are really helping uh, affiliate marketers be more successful with the platform? It's different API integrations. Um, you know, Outbrain has our own internal API, which we didn't in the past. So to my point of bidding up and down on publisher sections, you can actually set up automated rules now in, in the platform to say, if this publisher section is 30% more than my CPA goal, well, I'm gonna bid down 50% from a CPC on it to make it less competitive. So those automated rules are really, really helping now, but there's also other platforms and, and, and trackers like a volume optimizer, um, Union Square Media's Maximus, right? Like all these external tools that will help kind of take you to the next level. That's really what, what people are using. Um, to really see everything and make the adjustments that they that they need to. It's interesting. And in terms of say like our customers using it, I'm assuming that we can just send you post backs. Um, is there only, is the concept of attribution on your side just a single conversion? Like it either, either the customer bought or is, is there any other data points that they can send back to your platform that helps with optimization? Yeah, yeah, the thing that we can do um, with a, with a company like Everflow is be able to set up up to 20 different conversion actions within an account, right? So you can actually say, did this 
person make a purchase? Maybe not, but did they add it to their cart? Yes. Did they sign up for the newsletter? Yes. Did they maybe click on a particular image that you know if they click on this image that it, they're more inclined to buy by 10%? You can set up all those rules um, based on post backs and based on event-based rules um, pretty, pretty easily. And we can track all of those things and optimize to all of those things. A lot of times people will even optimize towards the landing page click-through rate Mm -hmm. um, because it's a really good indicator of whether a publisher section is going to work for them or not, right? Like if um, CNN has a 40% landing page click-through rate, but maybe um, Bleacher Report has a 5% landing page click-through rate with the same amount of traffic, well, we know people coming from Bleacher Report reading about sports, probably not interested in our product. So we're going to knock that publisher out of there. And that's an event-based rule mm -hmm. that you can create as well. That's super interesting. So one of the things that we uh, we've always had a pretty like interesting way of managing Google ads, but now we're upgrading it to use, just go off our HubSpot data where we're firing off like when we get a demo request, that's like one event. When we do, they become like a prospect after doing a demo, that's the second event. And finally, when they become a customer, that's a third event. Uh, could we be firing if like we or someone who is setting up a similar like B2B type campaign, can they be firing off all those events and say like, this value is worth X, this value is worth Y, so that they know like, okay, like maybe this obscure placement is only sending like a teeny amount of traffic, but like they're getting to being customers. How does that work? Yeah, a hundred percent. You can set your value um, depending on each conversion point. You can actually dynamically pass back order value too, if it's something where you have a product that has, you know, bundles or things like that. That's what a lot of people are doing too. dynamically, like the bigger customers are dynamically passing back that order value. So we're optimizing towards that instead of just front end CPA. But even if it's a static value, you can add that at the conversion point and it's all ingested into the platform too. And does Outbrain do anything with um, audience data or is it completely focused on what is the publication and the levers around that? How do, how do you handle that side? We do um, minimal minimal audience data reporting. I mean, we have, from the targeting perspective, we have a bunch of third-party data integrations. You can target mothers of kids one to three years old. You can target people interested in a loyalty and rewards card just from our third-party segments. What we don't do is report back on demo data, male, female, age, stuff like that for clicks. We do report on their interest profile. So what you know, vertical of, of article they read more frequently, whether it's tech, whether it's travel, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we, yeah, we, we don't report on any like kind of more personal information and, and demo data like that. Yep. Kind of tying into what you just maybe said is a good point is any conversion event that you create can be created as a, um, a custom audience segment, right? So if there's card abandonment or if there's, just website visitors, or you can even upload your own list through a DMP, like a live ramp, um, something like that. You can put that on the platform. You can build a lookalike model off of any audience segment. So there's different modeling that we can do, but just not any, you know, real audience data of who that, that person is. So for affiliate marketers that are starting like a new campaign or offer and everything so there's not a ton of data um would you recommend that they touch audience data or is it like many dsps where the cost of reaching specific audiences is so much more than the value of just reaching everyone like i i know for some dsps like audience data is actually sort of like a really bad idea and you sh you should just focus on the end results for everyone um what are your thoughts there for especially like a new campaign before you have a ton of data to scale on? Yeah, 99% of the time, we don't recommend any advanced audience data from the beginning. We use the headlines and images to overqualify the audience. We put us on the best inventory stack possible and we kind of let it rip in a, in a run a network type situation and, and make some heavy optimizations. There are rare occurrences though, where it's, it's kind of necessary. Mm -hmm. Like we um, just got a proposal yesterday that we're going to work on it's uh, basically, it, it's targeting parents of teenagers that have been affected by social media, like Facebook, and Instagram, and all that kind of stuff. And there's a big lawsuit going on. And for something like that, 
it makes more sense to use some of those third party audience segments to say, I'm, I only want to target parents with this, or I only want to target the users that frequently read content about parenting because it's such a niche um, topic that has a large enough scale to it, which is an important thing yeah. um, that, that it works. You know, if, if you're trying to promote something where it's a, you know, a gut health supplement, like the gut health third party audience really isn't that large. So the juice isn't worth the squeeze, like you said. Um, so most of the time, that's why we stay away from it. Great. And um, are you, there's some industry, I mean, I think you mentioned a little bit about this, but what industries are you seeing like a big up uptick of like spend and success? Is that mainly like the, the lead gen spaces have really started driving more results? Yeah, in our world, lead gen, um, for sure. Just because you get more data back when you run a campaign. You know, if you're if you're getting your lead costs and your acquisition costs is under ten dollars for some of these insurance leads or for solar, you know, under forty dollars, getting that data back compared to a health supplement that's you know taking you 120, 150 dollars to get one conversion. The more data you get back, the quicker you can optimize, the better the algorithm becomes. And all those things are really starting to perform well in our world. From like an enterprise world, though, now bigger companies are starting to test on Outbrain more than ever because they realize it's, it's you know, an appropriate tool and as frustrated as they get with all the Facebook and Meta stuff. And the more they try and diversify, like we're finally starting to feel some of that diversification coming through, I think, where people have been talking about it for three to five years, but <laughs> nothing ever changed with those platforms for them to need to diversify. It was always just, a, oh, we need to because we're still relying on it. But now they're getting bit by everything going on that they're finally starting to commit to testing other channels. So we're seeing a lot of those bigger fortune companies starting to test, which is which is pretty cool and, and coming in with uh, some really cool campaigns. So I think that's going continue to continue to move too. It must be, it must be a crazy exciting time on your side. I mean, uh, there was like, I remember reading like an investment report about Shopify and they're saying that the biggest source of traffic for uh, sh like Shopify merchants is basically Facebook ads other than like their like own organics, like Facebook ads was how Shopify was built. Like every single store started buying stuff on Facebook and then like they scaled from there. It, like now that Facebook is a shadow of itself, I'm sure that like so many of those new Shopify and successful Shopify merchants are really going to need to find the next performance channel, which you're well suited to be at. Totally, totally. And not to go too deep into it, but just being code on the publisher page helps with that tracking situation because we're not an app, right? Like we're mm -hmm. not within the walls of this network that you can't track things. So the tracking and conversion data is is better reported throughout brain too which which helps the situation obviously it's fun to sit in this chair to say that to people rather than being in the facebook chair so for sure <laughs> awesome thank you so much for your time um how can the audience learn more about you and is there anything else you'd like to shout out um yeah just hit me up on linkedin on skype search my name you'll find me and uh first initial last name at outbrain.com and no that's about it shout out my wife natalia my dog noah who's a seven month old golden retriever and um yeah that's uh that's about it thanks for having me man appreciate it awesome it's always great to be able to speak with experts and it's, it's always fun when you can be honest because <laughs> yeah in your best interest totally completely agree cool all right thanks everyone